This episode of the Justin Robert Young Podcast is a brought to you by, as always, The Contender, the game of presidential debate. Uh, man, well, what else can I say about this uh, this year game? You know, it, it's it's super fun. Everyone loves it. Uh, it is uh, so easy. Just go on over to thecontender.us. I, I'm just going to ask you this. If you're, if you're curious about what the game is about, head on over to the Amazon. Uh, we have a five-star review rating on there with hundreds of reviews. Just go ahead and check it out. See what other people are thinking about the game. And then when you're done, either buy it on there if you got Prime, totally cool, or come on over to thecontender.us where you can not only buy the game, you can buy our two expansions. Uh, man, I'm so proud of it. I'm so excited for you guys to play it and let me know what is going on all up in your mind when you play it. Uh, just hit us up at our social media, at Contender Game or Facebook.com slash The Contender Game. And by stickers or DIAF. Hey, uh, do you want stickers that are based on a uh, podcast that I do that you're listening to right now? Like, let's say a jury, please don't die sticker. That'd be really nice. Or maybe uh, some spearmint nitrate. How about you go ahead on over to Stickers or DIAF and get a sticker pack? Right now, we got a Spearmint Nitrate Head, Jury Please Don't Die, Dare Sticker, Politics, 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 I Got a Robot Face Bro, and Limited Edition Knife Fight Captain Morgan, an original for Stickers or DIAF. Go ahead and check it out. Stickers or DIAF.com. And finally, by Patreon, patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. You support not only this show, but also politics, 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 and this weekend, we will be out on the road thanks to you guys. Louisville on Friday, uh, Cincinnati on Saturday, and Chicago on Sunday. Friday and Sunday will be live podcasts. We'll be doing politics, 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 and jury live in the living rooms of patrons. Man, I, I, ah, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more during the show. But thank you guys so much. It just kind of settled in today. Uh, but uh, you have no idea how grateful I am to everybody that supports this show. Please go ahead. If you get value out of it, then let's go ahead on over. Patreon.com slash J-U-R-Y. But enough. Let's Let's stop talking about maybe kind of sort of doing the show, what do you say we just go ahead and do the show right now? Welcome. Welcome, friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another edition of the Justin Robert Young Podcast. My name is Justin Robert Young, and I'll be bringing you uh, a bunch of stuff. Man, we got a lot to talk about. I'm going to give you guys a, a, a life hack today. I'm going to give you guys something that you can apply to your daily existence that uh, will make your life better. Better. Immediately. You know, it's something that I, uh, I, 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 I'm always shocked that more people don't kind of think like this. Now, this isn't me uh, being a conceited jerk, although I, I almost certainly am. But we got to we gotta break down some stuff. Because, like, I, I'm just going to let you all know, I'm kind of sick of it. I'm sick of it. And I think, I'm not talking to you guys listening, because we're all in the Cool Kids Club. 
I'm talking about this stuff that's happening outside. Outside our walls. Outside our walls, we have a serious problem. Serious. Serious problem. It is eroding our very fiber of existence. It is eroding our culture. It is not good for the culture what is happening. And that is something that we aim to solve on this podcast. But we're first going to have to tear it down, and then we're going to have to build it back up. And I'm going to give you two examples from the news of how you can understand these situations and do better to resolve them. Let's start with the, let, let's commence the demolition. Because I'm a little fired up here. Because I'm, I'm just, like I said, I've had it up to here with some of this. You might have seen on, uh, on your Facebook feed, there was a bit of a controversy this week. A controversy. That uh, Jennifer Lawrence plays the character Mystique in the X-Men franchise. They got a new X-Men movie coming out. And it stars Oscar Isaac as Apocalypse. Apocalypse is a bad guy if you're not familiar with the X-Men universe. Movie's called X-Men Apocalypse. So... Oscar Isaac's your big bad guy. This is a, a in, in, the, in the world of X-Men, you know, Apocalypse is a fairly big bad, right? He is, he is one of the, the really hardcore. You know when Apocalypse shows up, he doesn't just show up to fart around, right? Like, you know, he's there to really wreck some stuff. Easily the most famous person in your cast is Jennifer Lawrence. She had the Hunger Games... Uh, very key in the demo people want to go see Jennifer Lawrence movies. So you got to find a way to, uh, to put Jennifer Lawrence up on the poster. And they did. They put her and Oscar Isaac playing Apocalypse up there on the poster. I'm going to show the YouTube audience or everybody watching us live on diamondclub.tv what this poster looked like it's a it's a oscar isaac in his apocalypse outfit choking jennifer lawrence now i saw this uh, there th this exact billboard is up uh in between my house and the guts and glory office my, my partner's on the contender so I've seen this a couple times. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, right? You know, it, normally with uh, those big kind of event billboards, it's a lot of, like, people kind of looking, you know, looking hard, right? In poses, maybe, like, in a, a, a big scene in the movie. So I haven't seen the flick yet. It's out now. But, uh, but maybe this is a tremendously pivotal moment, and so they want to bring it to life. So, these posters were up for a while, and then Rose McGowan, she's the first person I saw talking about this, uh, had an opinion and said, uh, hey, this is damaging and it's stupid. It's trivializing violence against women, and even in a heightened science fiction context, it's a poor decision to have something that is fairly a, a, a routine domestic violence situation be your representation of this, uh, this conflict. All right, now I'm going to stop this segment right here. We're going to do a little choose your own adventure. If you agree with Rose McGowan, pause. Uh, or rather, skip ahead, because I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. And if you disagree with what Rose McGowan said, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that this segment right now, starting now, for you. So here's the this is again choose your own adventure. Uh, this is the I disagree with Rose McGowan part. 
which is an example of how these this uh, social justice warrior culture has degraded and insulted our intelligence. That we are made to believe that everybody is so sensitive, is so hashtag trigger warning, is so in a bubble, in a, in a big millennial bubble, that we can't discern the fact that this is obviously somebody who's dressed up like a big crazy weirdo, choking somebody who is in blue face paint and blue body paint with slick back hair. This is obviously science fiction violence. And you can no more look at this and say that it's damaging to our culture than you could say, oh, I now can't have a sword on a Warcraft poster because I once cut my finger. Meh, meh, meh. Look, another thing for these libtards to complain about. Okay, so this is where I'm ending the disagree with Rose McGowan part. And now I'm gonna begin now the, uh, the agree with Rose McGowan part. Okay, so now I've ended my one thing that was diametrically opposed. Now we're gonna start with the agree with Rose McGowan part. It is mind blowing to me that people can't understand this very simple concept. That you can't understand that when a man has a powerful woman by the throat, and that is the way to symbolize that you have completely stripped her of her power, that not only are you feeding the emotion from that moment based on horrible atrocities that happen far too often and we don't talk about? But you are also giving rise to a pervasive culture of violence against women. Because for as much as anybody wants to talk about what Rose McGowan said, I wish that just a fraction of it was, uh, was, was spent talking about Everything else that happens that we that we just brush under the rug. That for every rape scandal, for every uh, a, a celebrity who goes to jail for beating their wives, like we have one right now. We have uh, you know, the Johnny Depp thing. Now, I don't know if Johnny Depp really beat his wife. I don't know if him throwing some shit at her face was the reason why she had that bruise. But I know that we're really eager to sweep that under the rug. We're really eager to just uh, button things, these things up. And so if the only way that we can get a dialogue about the violence that happens against women on the front page, in people's mouths, is to talk about it when, when uh, a mystique gets choked out by apocalypse, then I'm sorry, I got a hard time saying that that's a problem. I think that that is a solution. Okay, so that ends my... Uh, that ends my pro Rose McGowan uh, uh, portion. So, so now we've had the anti Rose McGowan portion and we've had the pro Rose McGowan portion. Um, now I did those separately. So to illustrate a point, because I find that there are kernels of understanding and truth in, in both Arguments, to be honest with you, being honest with you. I, I, I'm just being honest. Oh. oh. But I want to, and, and, and in full disclosure, I probably land more on, on, on the Rose McGowan side than I do on, on the, the anti-Rose McGowan side. Full disclosure. But here's what I don't cotton to. When has yelling about this stuff solved anything? When has raising our voice and screaming about it solved anything? Now, I'm not talking about that you shouldn't make a point of it, right? I'm talking about the, the, the point of change, the point of gathering people and, and building a more reasonable society is predicated on the fact that the person that you're talking to isn't going to turn their ears off as soon as you open your mouth. And I think it's frustrating, and I think it's hard, and I think that there are people who are disproportionately affected by this kind of stuff. 
that got that have a fight, a dog in this fight, that that's their natural reaction. You should be able to yell, right? Like I'm not saying don't yell. I'm not saying don't make a big deal. You should be able to do it. But like, just don't fool yourself into thinking that that's that you've done something, right? Yelling is an expression of your pain. Yelling is an expression of your anguish. And that's good to clear the system. But if you think that you're doing something, if you think that you're building a future, if you think that you are advancing the cause that has caused you so much pain you needed to exhale it like volcanic, uh, an undersea volcanic vent, then I, I kind of disagree with you, humbly. Now, if I were going to yell about it, I'd probably yell something more like what the Rose McGowan side was. Now, why? Well, because my mom was choked out by my dad, and I saw bruises on her. So, yeah, sites of domestic violence, probably a, a conversation about domestic violence, is something that I'm going to be a little bit more involved in. I'm going to be a little bit more passionate about i'm gonna feel a little bit more than i would about another topic why because i got skin in the game i have a motivation i have if you want to use it cynically an agenda does that make my agenda negative i don't know that's up to you to decide i don't think so i think i'm just trying to express the fact that i'm a flawed person in a big bad flawed world right and if we're all going to ping pong around and bash into each other, then why don't we try to better things? Why don't we try to talk about it? Because the idea that we can get to a dichotomy point where people are screaming and yelling uh, and, and just going back and forth uh, in this feedback loop of like uh, SJW libtards, uh, uh, people don't understand that uh, violence is happening. like, And both can kind of spin by themselves and perpetuate each other and and then not and then meanwhile demonize the other side like i don't get it i just don't i don't i don't understand it like i i and and that's what here i'm gonna i'm gonna yell now because here's where my point of pain is is that like i don't find that to be a serious discussion and for all the little bits of kernels, the little bits of truth that I might find in, in, in the, in the Libtard SJW argument where, where censorship and self-censorship uh, has, has uh, increased on a cultural level and we are cutting off uh, uh, elements of, of expression in our society, yeah, I kind of agree with that. I'm not going to say sh anything about it at all, ever. Why? Because I don't want to be associated with the people yelling. And as much as I believe that personally... That there is an institutional problem with violence against women and our inability to discuss it on a national cultural level. I don't really say all that much about it unless it's in a personal context where I can make it about me and not about the larger thing. Because I find the term as social justice warrior ridiculous. And, and I, I don't just want to be swept up into the feedback loop. And here's the thing. I don't think I'm alone. In fact, I think that this is the community that is listening to me right now that is much like my way of thinking. I think that there are so many of you listening to me right now that believe, like, can we just knock it off? Because there is a wide swath of, of, our, of our culture that wants to chime in, probably has valuable things to say, but wouldn't be caught dead standing next to some of the lunatics that are allowed to carry the banner of important issues forward. So how do we fix it? Well, I'll tell you right after this.
So there was another story that caught my eye last night. I'm not a huge... Uh, I'm not a huge MMA fan. I'm not a huge uh, UFC fan, but I pay attention to it here and again. Uh, you know, I, I think it's. Uh, I think. I think when it's good, it's. Uh, it, it's all right. But it was announced last night that uh, 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 the the UFC's biggest star, Brock Lesnar, is uh, coming back to the UFC to fight one fight. This was big news because. He, uh, Brock Lesnar, is currently under contract to the World Wrestling Entertainment Corporation, uh, the pro wrestling outfit, and uh, so it was very odd that he was coming back to fight for UFC. I found out about this because uh, it blew up on Twitter when a reporter, Ariel Helwani, broke it. Uh, I, I'm peripherally... Uh, I'm prolifer uh, prolifer yeah, prolifer Per oh, man, this is going to be a disaster. Uh, peripherally educated about Ariel Helwani's work. I don't read him regularly, but I see his name pop up enough to know that if you were to ask me to name an MMA journalist, he would probably be the only one that I knew that wasn't an ex-fighter. He apparently, it was right before his uh, the the main event, of uh, the card that was happening that night where they were going to and did announce officially that Brock Lesnar was coming back. That they escorted Ariel Helwani out, him and his uh, cameraman and videographer. They uh, escorted them out and uh, told them that they would no longer be welcome at UFC events. Their credentials were forevermore revoked. So now the big fallout happens. Uh, you're suppressing the press is gonna is the charge against the UFC, uh, and then you know anybody who's uh, on the UFC side will you know point out a million reasons professionally or personally why why Ariel Helwani was asking for it and deserved it. My opinion on this is that. Uh, Ariel Helwani is somebody that does a very good job, breaks a lot of news, is obviously very connected, and has a lot of sources. In an insular community like UFC is, word travels fast. There's probably only, you know, four, maybe 400 people, max, tops, including journalists, that are professionally involved in the machine that is mixed martial arts fighting, or UFC specifically. And so if somebody's reasonably well-connected into that universe, then you're going to hear a lot of stuff off the record and on the record. Brock Lesnar coming back to UFC is a huge, huge, huge story that I can understand Ariel Helwani's uh, opinion that he would like to break it. He would like to have it be his scoop. And the UFC's point of view that they want to, if they have the ability to spring a massive story on an unsuspecting public, that they want to do that. They were not able to, because Ariel Helwani won that particular contest. He reported it as a rumor before them. Now, UFC has the ability to uh, confirm it. That's its own news story, as it certainly was. UFC's official video that they played not only for the local crowd, but also posted on Twitter and Facebook, uh, made the rounds tremendously. Now, what many of you are saying is, Justin, this is boring. I don't care about journalism or MMA. Why are you telling us this? Especially after that really stupid and insane bipolar first segment. Here's why. Because without knowing anything about this, I know almost exactly what happened. And I know how it's different than other situations. Because I want to tell you something. Life is explained by the systems it is created from. 
If you understand the systems, if you understand the motivations, if you understand how things are built, you can have life make a lot more sense immediately. It's like putting on prescription glasses. Life just makes more sense. Because it's very, 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 very easy for us in life when we face things that are confusing to just throw up our hands and say, hey, listen, this is absolute garbage. Uh, I, I, I don't get it. You're crazy. In fact, here's, here's a great little exercise. Strike the word crazy from your vocabulary. Crazy is a terrible word. A terrible, terrible, terrible word. Not because people do not act erratically. No, they do. It's just that crazy and on steroids are two of my least favorite terms on the planet. Because they've lost any and all meaning. But he's crazy to me might not be crazy to you. So let's apply this way of thinking to the UFC. Because immediately I saw wise people, wise people on Twitter saying, oh, well, look, the UFC is worse than uh, the NFL or the uh, NBA with strong man commissioners. And the answer is, of course. Because the UFC is literally just three people at the top. There's two owners and, and a, a managing partner, basically. A guy who runs the day-to-day -day in Dana White. All you got to do is piss off one of those people. And you are cooked, right? The, the, they've got hands on the button that can just uh, revoke your credentials forever. Like happened to Ariel Helwani. Somebody got pissed off. I said, never again with him. Bah, he's out. Now, if they reconcile, it will be because one of them cooled down. Compare this to the NFL, wherein you have 30 owners and then a commissioner. If you destroy one of the teams as a journalist, like let's say repeatedly say that your team name is racist, just to give a random out-of-the-box example, then that is one-thirtieth of the power structure that's very mad. And that person can be furious, and he can go and knock down the commissioner's door and say, listen, never again does this person ever get to come to my games. And that commissioner might take action on it, but they might not. They might not because there are other people that are involved in the league, all 29 other owners, who might say, stop it. You're going to give us bad press. Whatever. He said your team's name is racist. It is racist. Whatever. So now understand where those lines, and I'm not saying that one system is better than the other. I'm just saying that it makes a lot of sense when you actually stop to think about it. Because not everything is the same. Same way that, hey, listen, we've all worked at different places. Your relationship with your superior is different in each and every one of them. You are more likely to survive and advance in your job if you understand how that system works. Nothing is unexplainable. Even people who act erratically very often have motivations that seem very, very clear to them in their head. In fact, we've all probably been those people. We've been those people who acted in a way that people found repugnant or stupid. I know I have. I know I've abused power. I know I've done things because I was thin-skinned and selfish. I know that I've done things that I regret out of self-preservation. What I want to get at with both of these segments is that the world is made better when you empathetically put yourself into the position of other people and therefore understand their stations in the systems for which they are operating. Because 
where we're at right now, and I don't think that like we've gotten any worse or whatever. Like I just think that it's more in our face because we have more platforms to talk about it. But the closer we get to opinions that are in our own, the more there's a tendency to demonize them. And all I want today, or anybody who's listening, is just to think about going the other way. Humanize instead of demonize. Think not, if you're on one side politically, if you're a Democrat, think not, oh, look at these racist animals that are going to vote for Trump. Think about what am I not seeing? What pain is on the other side? If you're a Trump supporter and, and, and you are, you know, uh, very upset with the Democratic side, same thing, man. What pain is on the other side that would make somebody so aggressive about their opinion? This is not me saying, hey, let's all hold hands and kumbaya, right? Disagreements, virulent disagreements that will never go away, that's fine. Like, that's life. But... Everything is worth being discussed. Everything. Everything in the world is worth being discussed and discussed multiple times and discussed how each person wants to discuss it. But very, very, very few things, in my opinion, very few discussions are worth losing or sometimes before they even start. Losing friendships over. That's my thought. More coming up after this. Y'all got to see this. If you are just listening, you got to go over to the YouTube. Now everybody in the chat room is actually linking hands. Oh, now I am. Now I am getting a little, I'm getting a little sentimental. I think I'm going to squirt a tear. Oh, you guys, you guys, I love you. Uh, all right. Uh, one, uh, one little personal story and then we'll get to emails. Uh, well, here, uh, let's take care of a little business here. Uh, number one, this podcast is up for a podcast award. I want you to go to hat.t2t2.eu, hat.t2t2.eu, H-A-T dot T number two, T number two dot E-U. Uh, there you will get all the instructions. Download a really fast and easy bookmarklet uh, where you can vote for our entire slate of podcasts, independent podcasts that are banding together to support one another to make sure that our voice is heard. Head on over there, hat.t2t2.eu. You can vote once a day, every day. One week remains in the voting period. All you got to do is just make double sure that as soon as you vote, you go to your email. You just got to click a link to verify your email. Uh, bada bing, bang, boom, you're done. Go ahead and check it out. Hat.t2t2.eu. Jury is up for a podcast award. And politics, politics, politics is up for one as well. Also, one more time, let's uh let's let's go ahead and get a big round of applause for all of our hosts for our in your house tour. That is going to be Louisville. Louisville on Friday. Uh, I'll be doing politics, politics, politics live there. 7 p.m. Uh, the house that we are going to be in. He's right next to the Louisville Slugger Field. So if you know that area, that's the area that we're going to do it. If you would like to come to the uh, to the show, then just email me, Jury Louisville. Jury Louisville to justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. Uh, the day of the event, I'll send you the exact address. Cincinnati, uh, we will start things off at 7 o'clock at the 16-bit bar. 
in downtown Cincinnati. We're just going to have a big meetup, hang out as long as y'all want. Sunday, we will be in, oh man, Glen something Heights. Glen something Heights. Uh, here we go. We will be in Glendale Heights, 7 p.m. Uh, the show's going to last for about an hour. Uh, it's a little bit outside of Chicago, but uh, go ahead and uh, email me, Jury Chicago, if uh, you want to come to that one. I will send you the address the day of the event. Either way, keep up with everything. Justin R. Young at Twitter and Snapchat for more details. But again, Louisville, Louisville on Friday, Cincinnati on Saturday, and Chicago on Sunday. That is next week. All the podcasts will, of course, be live in the feeds if you cannot uh if you cannot make it. But I would love to see as many of you as possible. Uh, man, do I have time for this segment? I think I have time for this segment. Let's go ahead and do this segment. Um, this is a big uh, time for graduations. A lot of people are graduating. High schools are graduating. And uh, colleges are graduating. It reminds me a lot of when I was going into college. Uh, I, I very much fell into the college industrial complex. I don't know if, if any of y'all had this happen to you. I suspect a lot of you, because it is a very smart audience. But, uh, you know, graduating high school, complicated, swirl of emotions, right? Made far worse. Like, uh, infinitely worse, a million times worse, by the college industrial complex. What is the college industrial complex? Well, I'll tell you. College industrial complex is a combination of the following. SATs and college administration. Administration? Invitation? What's the word? Uh, admissions, college admissions. That's it. It is awful. I, oh my God, just thinking about it got me so worked, just got me so worked up. Because back in my day, right, we had the SATs, and then to practice for the SATs, this one all-encompassing test that would totally uh, uh, reshape your future, we had the PSATs, the practice SATs. And some of the kids got SAT tutors. Tutors that would then drill you on the SATs, make you take sample tests, get yourself ready. So when you took it the three times that you were going to take it, because it was uh, you were allowed to do it three times, you would score your best. You would do your best because this test was important with a capital I. Now, I loved my SAT tutor. I, man, I was with a bunch of other kids, and we were all doing these practice tests in the library, Broward County Library. I think it's the Broward County Library, the one on uh, Pine Island. And I was crushing it. Man, oh, I'd kill it. I was doing, I was getting all these words. Man, this is around the time that I was watching a lot of, uh, like, Kevin Smith movies. Kevin Smith movies killed it for me when it came to SAT prep. Man, I would just know so many words because that dude written wrote in such a verbose fashion. I remember one time I uh I I I got what was uh what was the word? Uh predilection? I think predilection was the word. I got predilection right because of Dr. Evil's therapy monologue in Austin Powers, the first one. Oh no, penchant. I think it was yeah uh, a penchant, a penchant for buggery. <laughs> that was the line, and I got it. I got penchant, and and they were like, "Oh man, how'd you know what penchant was?" I'm like, "Austin Powers, dude. Am I the only one that memorized that entire movie? We're in the late '90s. Let's listen to Smash Mouth. Somebody wants anyway." Uh, and then the SATs came around.
the SATs came around and all of a sudden everything started to tighten up. I went and tried to take the test and I was late. I was going to the wrong room. I mean, all right, so I wasn't even late. I was on time. They just didn't do a good job of telling me where in the building the actual room was. So like, you know, they, they sent me on this wild goose chase. I'm sweating bullets because, again, we've told a bunch of 17-year-olds that their life depends on this one test. That's a great idea because there's nothing else to worry about when you're 17 years old. Oh, no. Oh, geez, yeah. Your mind's just free and clear. You're totally in a realm of zen. Of course, Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this one test. Oh, this one test. Oh, if you score poorly on it, don't worry, you can take it again. But you'll only have one chance after that. And after that, your entire life will be marked permanently by what you do on this one test. Then I go to this place, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's just down the hall to the right. But meanwhile, there's a lot of to the rights. How many to the rights am I looking at? I'm banging on doors. I'm looking for the place where this is supposed to happen. And finally, I find it, and I am 10 minutes late, and the proctor of the SAT looks at me with a stink eye. Like, how would I even get an advantage on the desk by showing up late. I am drenched in sweat like I got out of a pool, and this dude is staring daggers at me. Where do you get off? You're a terrible person. I'm putting that proctor on blast. You're an awful person. I think that you are, are just, you're the kind of person that would pull the wings off a beautiful butterfly. If you can take a look at somebody who is shaking like a, like a leaf in a gale force windstorm on a fragile tree, if you can look and, and show cruelty to that miserable son of a bitch, then you are terrible. I tanked that. I did like 300 points worse uh, on, on my actual SAT than I was doing on the PSAT practice ones when I was just trying to remember words from, you know, like Fight Club and Mall Rats. And of course, that all feeds into the admissions. Because in the college industrial complex, everything is in relation to somebody else. Now, I might have gone to a public school in Florida, but we had some really smart kids coming out of that. Kids going to Yale. Kids going to Harvard. So immediately, you kind of slot in this pecking order. Oh, okay. Well, this kid's really, really smart. He's going to Harvard. Makes sense. He works really hard. He's the valid Victorian. He has a great record. Oh, these kids are all going to state schools. Makes sense. They've been on Florida prepaid since they were born. But then where are you going to go? Everybody else, it makes perfect sense. But you, oh, no. I applied to four schools. And every day I'd come into my AP homeroom class and you just dread seeing some kid on a Monday, on a Monday morning who was, you know, all of a sudden, hey, why are you wearing a Northwestern jacket? Oh, I just got in there. Why are you wearing a Florida State jacket? Why are you wearing a UCF jacket? Why are you wearing a University of Miami jacket? Why are you wearing? Why are you wearing? Why are you wearing? Because they have their future settled. They have their future settled. They have their future settled. And it's better than yours, better than yours. Eh, maybe the same. Ah, it depends. Depends on where you get in. Depends on where you get in. Now, it, the uncertainty only ratchets up as the picture slowly develops around you, but you do not know where you are placed within it. And in the midst of that, you got to take the SAT again. Oh, by the way, take the SAT again. Oh, also, uh, uh, you're still trying to lose your virginity. Don't worry about that. Oh, also, you just crashed your car. Don't worry about that. Oh, also, this test determines your entire life. And then also, you're going to have a bunch of people that you've never met in your entire life look over just a cold review of your life on a piece of paper and make a determination where you will go, what future you have, whether or not your dreams, your hopes, your goals will be a reality or whether or not you will just die on the vine. 
So I applied to four schools. New York University, Northeastern, or no, sorry, Boston University. It was New York University, Boston University, Syracuse University, and my safety school, the University of Florida. Now, no surprise, I've talked about being in Syracuse before. I got into Syracuse. Syracuse was my number one school because it had the best journalism program. And oh, oh man, I was excited. Now all of a sudden, it's like seeing that whole picture slowly come into focus, except there's me. Oh, in a gold-plated uh, uh, horse and buggy. Both the horse and the buggy are gold-plated. F it, man. We have an infinite amount of dreams, and we have just tapped into this well. yeah Oh, I was feeling great, feeling high. There's no way this can go wrong. I got into my number one school. Then I got the Boston University letter. Rejected. Then I got the New York University letter. Rejected. And I'm like, oh, shit, man. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good I got in. Pretty good I got in. Because this right now, this would be me unraveling into sawdust. I would be decomposing like a mummy if I had not gotten the Syracuse letter first. But at least I got University of Florida, right? I mean, push comes to shove. It's a big state school. You know, I got to deal with Gainesville, which, eh. But whatever. We can figure it out. Get my University of Florida letter. I open it. Waitlisted. Waitlisted is what they tell Florida residents who don't get in. Woo! I don't know what it feels like to literally have a bullet whiz by my ear and have your hair get singed. But I do know that if I were to have that happen to me, I would compare everything to my only frame of reference, which is the college industrial complex and how narrowly I survived it. So if there is anybody listening right now, any high school student, any parents of a high school student, know that my empathy goes out to you and yours because the college industrial complex now as a 32-year-old man is the most stressful. 33. Oh, geez, shows my counting skills. I did do terrible on the math section of the SAT. Know that as a 33-year-old man, that was maybe the most stressful six months of my entire life. We will be back with our uh, emails right after this. You can always email the show, justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. Justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. Please make sure you put jury in the subject line. If you don't put jury in the subject line, then when I'm very rapidly and, and only half paying attention trying to put together everything for the show, then I will very easily miss your email if you do not put jury in the subject line. Uh, Tall Geese writes, I was listening to the most recent episode of the Jury Podcast where you and your wife were discussing the recent events of killing uh, Harambi to save the life of a four-year-old who fell into his enclosure. As a father of a four-year-old myself, I wanted to give my thoughts from the perspective of a parent. Had it been my child, my first priority would have been to save my son. This shouldn't be any shock, as I am sure parents would think the same. Uh, that's not to say that I am callous toward the loss of Harambi. I agree with Ashley's points that animals in captivity shouldn't be a thing, my one concession being animal sanctuaries. I was vegan for two years and understand the pain and suffering we put animals through to turn a profit. That being said, some of the comments toward the parents, and really parents in general when this sort of thing happens, were utterly ridiculous. 
You and Ashley hit the nail on the head. Kids are ninjas when it comes to getting out of your sight. Doesn't matter how vigilant a parent you are, eventually you have to take your eyes off the kid for one reason or another. I think kids have a sixth sense for when they uh, know that they're not being watched and it's their time to be curious because that's how they learn. It seems the whole thing was a cascading series of unfortunate events and that unfortunately resulted in a majestic creature losing his life. I apologize for the long email, so I'll sum it up with this. Judging by the comments and uh, that flood in after these type of stories go public, I feel single people have trouble grasping an important motivation from parents, which is natural since they aren't parents. The fact of the matter is that a child is an extension of yourself, sentient and motivated. They embody so many emotions and aspirations of the parent that, that, that is protecting them, in a sense, protecting yourself. You might even call it self-defense. It's a biological imperative to protect them and to prefer their life over any other. Had it been me in that situation, I would have no problem pulling the trigger myself. No other speeches has survived. Life's evolutionary royal rumble would do any differently. Thank you for uh, talking about the subject objectively, and thank you for making the great content that you do. Well, thank you, Tall Geese, for writing in. And CP Sia says, Hi, Jerry, fan of yours and the frog pants. Uh, the uh, your end, please don't die, has helped me from time to time. A uh, nice reminder that there is more in life, even if I'm having a funky few days. But the bigger question is, I am an active hike a bunch uh, XC ski, and I love being outdoors. But I smoke a pack a day, even though I'm relatively healthy. I'm killing myself, and I don't want to go out that way. Any advice on how to stop? Thanks. Keep up the great work. Longtime fan, Chris from Vermont. Uh, oh, sorry. I guess, I guess I don't know what CPCYA is. Nice meeting you at uh, N14. Peace out. Well, thank you, Chris from Vermont. Uh, I've never been a cigarette smoker, um, but uh, uh, so I don't know how to quit. Uh, I, I all I have done in my life in terms of helping to quit is all my smoker friends. I used to think it was really, really funny, and I think I probably still do think it's really funny that as a non-smoker. I would bum cigarettes from them when I was drunk and then smoke them poorly to their great frustration. <laughs> I would just light their money on fire by really, really demanding that now was when I wanted to pick up smoking. And they'd be like, no, you don't. You just want to waste a cigarette. And I'm like, no, I do. I really think that smoking's cool and I want to get into it. And you know, after a while, you take a little bit of time to convince them. And eventually everybody's drunk, so they let you smoke a cigarette. And you're like, well, that's one less that you will have in your lungs. You're welcome. Crunchy says that's a dick move in the chat room. And you're right. It is. What do you say we both just leave? This was a very preachy episode. So uh, I, I thank you guys for dealing with it. Uh, you can please email the show, justinrobertyoung at gmail.com. Put jury in the subject line. Find this podcast on Stitcher, iTunes, or anywhere else. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to it. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Justin R. Young for all of them. Again, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Now is a great time to get on that train because we got the big trip coming up. And, of course, hashtag join the conversation at diamondclub.reddit.com. Vote every day at hat.t2t2.eu. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your old pal, Justin Robert Young, saying please go. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>